Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to Light Channel Denmark. Today we are so blessed having uh, Jonathan uh, Gray with us again here in studio. And uh, we have had a couple of uh, programs with him. And uh, if you haven't seen them, you can watch them on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, last time uh, we were asking some questions from his book, uh, Discoveries, Questions and Answers. And um, I really encourage you to watch it. It's really interesting. And uh, one of the questions which was brought up was, um, um, how could it be that all this finding is true if it hasn't been on the news, in television, in newspapers? And we know that the answer was, it has been on television. It has been on many radio programs. So, and another question was, how could it be that one man could find all these discoveries? Have you wondered about that? You know, that was one of the questions which Jonathan was asking Ron Wyatt. And I was really touched by the answer which um, Ron Wyatt was uh, answering. So he actually said, I am a nobody. And if God gave this to me, it's because I'm a nobody. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, God says, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Then uh, I am continuing, and I am just a foolish man. God has chosen me. After I came to him, I wanted to make up for my wasted years. I asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord impressed me to go after these discoveries. So if you feel that you are nothing, maybe that is just the person God needs. Because when we feel a need, the Lord really can use us because we will give the glory back to the Lord. And that's the same with Jonathan Gray. He gives all the glory to the Lord for everything he has been showing him he has really confirmed the, um, this, all these discoveries which Ron Wyatt was finding. So today we will get some more answers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so grateful that you are our father and that we, are, that we are your children. And just like parents love their children, you love us so much. You have said that when we are in lack of wisdom, we can pray to you and you will give it to us. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, all the knowledge you have given to Jonathan. We praise you, Lord, that he wants to share it with the world. And we pray, Lord, that every listener will be blessed and that they will have a deep longing in their heart to get to know you. We know that the eternal love, life is to know you, Jesus Christ, and uh, your Father. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will give us your Holy Spirit now and bless the program. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Eva, and thank you all for joining us tonight on the Light Channel. We have again the pleasure to continue our series entitled The Supernatural Discoveries, Miracles and Enemies with our second episode. And that will be again a Q&A, a, a critical Q&A episode to these supernatural discoveries. Our guest for this episode is again Jonathan Gray, live from New Zealand. Stay tuned, we will be right back.
right, thank you, Jonathan, for joining us tonight on our second webcast episode here in Denmark. It's 8 a.m. at your location, so we really appreciate your effort to be part of this webcast. Welcome. My pleasure to be with you, Michael. All right, for our viewers that doesn't know you, maybe somebody's tuning in on the second episode, uh, or you have not seen our first webcast with, uh, with Jonathan Gray, with your testimony, I would recommend you to go on our YouTube channel, Light Channel DK, and see our programs, videos with Jonathan and with his testimony. That will give you a more complete picture of who Jonathan is and why we are even having this uh, conversation, this uh, uh, Q&A. All right, let's continue our Q&A uh, where we left in the first episode, and let's start with one of the major critical questions about Noah Sarek. Because Jonathan, I believe personally that if one accepts it's for real, I mean the discovery about Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark, is the history and purpose of this story, one will have to accept the following discoveries as well. So Jonathan, before we you an actually answer the next question with who decide if it's really Noah Sark, would you please answer, try to answer on my comment, if one accepts the reality uh, that this is actually Noah Sark, as according to the story of the Bible, what will be the following consequences? What will have to change in terms of Bible, God, creation, origin of life, and so on? Well, these discoveries prove that the Bible is telling the truth. Mm. And if the Bible is truth, truth is one thing, it has a pattern of establishing truth in many things, then we can depend upon its promise of self if we will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. So the discovery is real, a, a, an opening wedge for salvation. And many families, many individuals, uh, their lives are turning around as a result of the discoveries as the mm. Holy Spirit reaches into their hearts and they accept it. Mm. All right. So now a lot of people, including myself, would probably expect such a huge discoveries, we're still talking about Noah Sark, to be, as we discussed before, but I will ask uh, a second question, which should be all over the news, should have a lot of archaeologists involved all over the place, but this is not really the case, is it, Jonathan? This is not what we see no. today. Well, what we, what we are seeing is that uh, so many people do not read the Bible correctly. Mm. When the Bible says the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat, it does not say it landed on Mount Ararat, per mm -hmm. se. Uh, Ararat actually is the old kingdom of Aratu, and that's really what the Bible is saying. The ark landed in the mountains of Aratu or, or Ararat, and uh, in the mountain range. Now, mm -hmm. Mount Ararat is not, not a range, it's a mountain, and it came up after the flood. It was not there for the ark to land on at the end of the flood. We have historical evidence of its uh, coming up, the eruption about a thousand years after the flood, and that's Turkish history. So uh, people who are going onto Mount Ararat looking for the ark are, are looking in the wrong place, Be and that's not where the Bible says it is. All right. Well, the question is that, uh, as I understand, a lot of uh, your critics, a lot of uh, Ron Wyatt critics are asking, who are you to decide that actually this is Noah Sark, just because you say so, just because the Bible says so. So people would ask this question, which comes up here on the screen. What do real archaeologists say about this? Do they think it's the Ark? Well, let me say this. The editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, uh, Herschel Shanks, uh, the uh, Biblical Research uh, Institute, Dr. Bill Shea, hmm. recognized archaeologist, Dr. Ekrem Archigal. Now, Dr. Ekrem Archigal is the Turkish leading archaeologist. 
And he said, there is no question in my mind that this is a boat. And when he was asked, what boat could it be up in the mountains? It can be no other than Noah's Ark. And he's mm. Turkey's leading archaeologist. Mm. Yeah, all right. So that's just uh, a few numbers of uh, other archaeologists which actually are confirming this discovery. So do Absolutely. We Okay, because if, if you go to mass media today, it's kind of like we need to get a uh, mainstream media or we need to get a, a certain number of archaeologists, maybe renowned archaeologists, to go for that discoveries, then everybody would accept that just because it, we have a, still a small number of archaeologists, you know, claiming that to be no sorry. So if you understand my point here, this is kind of uh, the mindset behind so how would you say that because of a majority of the archaeologists today still doesn't recognize that this is Noah's Ark, you still have a lot of evidence to prove it, vice versa. Isn't that so? Yes. The, uh, the fact that a majority of people will not accept truth mm. does not make the truth any less the truth. Mm. In fact, the Bible does say that you, you've plowed wickedness, reaped iniquity, be trusted in the multitude of your mighty men. A multitude does not decide the truth. The majority is wrong. But those who are honest and willing to change minds when they see evidence, uh, that's what the Lord requires. He requires to be honest with the truth, not follow a majority of people who are wrong. Mm. And we're going to get back on, on the honesty uh, part of, of the issue uh, in a few minutes. Now, the next question is also true that, and it's being claimed that no reputable Christian archaeologist gives credence to any of the discoveries, claims made by uh, Ron Wyatt and you, as it's being stated here. So is that true? This is a quotation uh, which I have from... Creation Science Answers in Genesis Allegation from March 1999. Yes. Well, now the word thing, no reputable Christian archaeologist to any of the discoveries. Well, mm -hmm. that is an absolute untruth. Mm -hmm. a, a, a little word we have in English language, lie, L I E, mm -hmm. and that's straight out untruthfulness. Mm -hmm. Now, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, Herschel Shanks, uh, actually has declared that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, not where it's going today in, in the so-called Sinai Peninsula. He has accepted the Christian archaeologist. He has accepted the truth of Sinai find. Hmm. Uh, and I mentioned Dr. Bill Shea. Dr. Bill Shea spoke to me personally. He is is Adventist Biblical Research Institute archaeologist mm. and uh, he said that he w went up and accompanied an expedition to the the, uh, the mud flow above the present Noah's Ark site claimed by Ron Wyatt mm. he accompanied a group up away and he says it looks to me like, like they landed higher up but then was slid down the hill for, uh, from a mud flow and that's what, where it is where it is today. So he has accepted the Noah's Ark site. So when, it, when we're told that no reputable Christian archaeologist accepts any of the discoveries, that's an absolute lie. The fact mm. is, I've, I've given you names of Christian archaeologists who accept the discoveries. Mm. And we discussed last time, actually, the, the fact that how could anyone call himself a Christian and actually doubting the Bible. You know, it doesn't really make sense, does it? <laughs> no, no, it cer certainly doesn't. Okay. Uh, we accept the Word of God, and if we mm. don't accept the Word of God, we're not a Christian, mm. no matter what we call ourselves. So this actually, these people that are still disputing your discoveries, Ron Wyatt's discoveries, and other people's discoveries, actually they're not disputing you or Ron Wyatt. They're disputing the Bible. Could that be so? They're fighting against God himself because mm. God's word is what they're, they're disputing. Mm. And actually, as we just started this uh, episode, just before we started this recording, we were discussing about a new 
a friend of yours, and you, uh, we will not mention his name yet uh, this time, and we will have uh, uh, rights to the uh, recordings. But as we speak, he's on the way to Turkey, uh, has just received, as I, I received email from him, uh, has just received the permit from the Turkish government to uh, start a new uh, digging session, or what would you call it? Could you, how, do you know, do you have any other information about this? Uh, it's actually a, a, a group of new have come together, and okay. uh, he, he uh, and uh, yes, the, 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 the government of Turkey is very cooperative. And in fact, that site, uh, they have recognized as the Noah's Ark site, the Turkish government had, and they've built a, and a visitor center has been built there, and the whole area has been called an international historical park by the Turkish government. And down, down the, at the foot of the mountain area, uh, you will see road sign. Road hmm. sign's been there for several years. New Hungamisi, which means the big boat of Noah. Hmm. And it points up the mountain to, to the area we've been for years. All right. All right. The Turkish okay. government is very cooperative. Mm, okay, and we do also have uh, in our future webcast we will have at least two persons uh, among this uh, other person we just mentioned that are going to relay their own personal experience and their own discoveries uh, with uh, with Noah Sark. But let's go ahead with our next question here, and this is going to be a personal one, and I, I mean no offense by it, but I'm sure other people have asked this question and probably still do. And the question comes that, were you and Ron Wyatt deceived and then you were too ashamed to admit it? And that's... Well, Ma Margaret Turney actually has, has put, it, uh, put it very nicely. She said, yeah. it is not possible that Ron and Jonathan are deceived in everything. They would have to be short in mentality. And of course, it's not only Ron and Jonathan have to include, but Marty Plot and the others in the teams. And the coincidence is way too high that everyone involved in the work is lacking some area in, of mental capacity. You must include Josephine Gray and Mary Nell Wyatt, as they all have been to many of the sites. If mentally deficient, then they're all liars. Mm. So it's not a case of just one or two people making the claim. There's... there's Lots of people now who have been to the sites and have looked mm -hmm. at the, every, the evidence who are making the same claim. So uh, if they're not deceived, they're lying. Mm -hmm. It's e easily the evidence. So, but, but then, okay, if you're, let's say, and of course I trust you, people might say, but you were deceived and run wide. That's not the case. You probably had uh, such a huge interest in that, and uh, you kind of overlooked some other evidence, and you ended it at a certain point, and you said, "Okay, well, I have enough evidence uh, to believe that this is so." So, were you? Would you believe that from a personal perspective? And as much as you personally know Ron White and the other people in the group, would that be possible that everybody kind of were deceived? and still be honest, would that be possible? Having in mind all these you know, experiences, uh, all these artifacts, all this testing you have done? The, the evidence is so overwhelming, and if, if the time had passed and all these extra visits that were made later uh, were going to produce the, the truth about it, Hmm. What I'm saying is this, that time will not uh, confirm the truth of something not true. Time will actually uh, enable people to find flaws in, in the, the claims that uh, prove it not to be true. Hmm. But now the visits that are made, the, the more firm comes the evidence, and this shows that this is correct. Hmm. Well, some other people have also claimed that you and Ron White were in this for the money and fame. And it happens to know a person actually is our program coordinator here at Light Channel in Denmark. She did actually visit you some years ago, but she never mentioned anything about your huge mansion, 
sport cars or any lavish lifestyle. So what is your answer to this accusation, uh, Jonathan? Well, uh, Michael, for the most part, we have financed our work on the discoveries out of our pockets. Hmm. Ron Wyatt sold a farm. He and his wife owned nothing except the equipment for their research. Hmm. They got rid of everything else so that they could continue the work. Myself and my wife placed all our possessions on the line. Hmm. Uh, we gave everything into this work. And our lifestyles, yes, are, are not lavish. We, we eat good food. We, we, uh, we're sensible in our way of life. It's, it's a modest way of life. And uh, when you spend enough time with, with somebody, you know what they're like. And I spent enough time with Ron Wyatt to know that he was not after money. Hmm. And as a matter of fact, uh, he was always giving glory to God. He was not after fame either. And uh, when he uh, was given money, he would, uh, when I, I would give him money uh, on a tour that he'd come, give the money back to me and say, keep that for your ministry. Uh, it's not money. It's not about money at all. Hmm. But when Ron, Ron died, uh, there was not enough money for his funeral. He hmm. had pulled into the work. All right. Well, what about fame? If you look back on your well, life... We you... Knew, yeah. we knew when we got into this that it would go against the grain of a lot of people because these discoveries are not what people would normally claim. Hmm. The fact is that people thought the, the Ark was on, on Big Mount Ararat, right? Hmm. And that's where books had been written and so on, although there was no evidence. Mm. And then to claim it was some uh, would go against the, the, the acceptance of many people. Mm. And, we, and the same with other discoveries that we talk about. The, the, the Red Sea crossing is not where most people expected it to be. Mm. Mount Sinai is not where most people expected it to be. And so those that are expecting something somewhere and you say it's not that's not going to make you popular so you're not going to get fame hmm. so we're not in it for fame or popularity we're in it for hmm. well let's let's actually cut to to the bottom and we we discussed actually this uh we had this conversation what i'm about to say in our first episode here and the previous one that what are you actually doing here by claiming that this is no historic and this is what we believe this is actually attacking the mainstream concept today, which is the evolution theory. So let's say it as it is. We're talking about having to accept uh, the Bible as being the word of God, something here which is actually proving that the Bible is true. That means that uh, the concept of evolution, it's actually a straightforward lie. It doesn't fit uh, in reality, doesn't fit with science, doesn't fit with archaeology because uh, of Noah's Ark. So could it be that it's actually, just to repeat here, that's actually the main reason why you're getting so much, uh, you know, critical, so, so many critics, so, uh, so many accusation. Could it be something to do with that, actually this very fact that you are attacking the mainstream idea about the origin of life? Well, yes, that, that's another reason from the, un the unbelieving world to accept what we are saying, they would have to give up what was their pet, pet, pet theory. Mm. And most people don't like to admit they've been wrong. Mm. And so they will attack anyone who comes along and shows them this is different from what they've been saying. Mm. So, so from that perspective, there is no way that the secular world will probably ever accept that this discovery is true. Let's say it as it oh, is. Uh, a secular world believing in evolution will never want to admit that. Mm. That's so so this, this conversation is mainly, it's not because we are not accepting to, to explain this to, to a secular person, but this conversation is more likely to go for uh, any person that has a belief in God, has a belief in Bible, or uh, any person that believes uh, he or she is uh, a, a Christian. So let's continue with, uh, with our conversation here because the same accusation is also related to uh, big money, as some people would say. 
So the question is that, did you and, and Ron Wyatt deceptively got big money again? And if you did, you know, uh, if this is the accusation as it comes here from uh, Pennington that writes, why is going around Australia, other places holding seminars and so on, he's selling large number of tapes uh, in the tens of thousands of dollars. And he's actually making a pretty uh, tough accusation here. His behavior and deceptive conduct in the corporate world will attract the attention of the law. And I, I find this uh, a very, very strong accusation, especially uh, without having any proof. Also, I believe that goes also against you. So if that was yes. so, <laughs> how would it be possible for you if you were getting a lot of money out of this, I don't know, for some reason. How would that be possible for you and Ron Wyatt and everybody else in your team and in Ron Wyatt's team to actually hide this from the entire world? Uh, it would be totally impossible, Michael. Uh, the truth, there's not one element of truth in Pennington's action. He said that Ron Wyatt went around and he was getting thousands of dollars in his tour of Australia. This was his last tour before he died. Hmm. Uh, and uh, he, in, in Australia, actually, the truth is that he did not have one cent of income from uh, uh, sales videos in his Austra last Australian tour that is being spoken of by this man. As a matter of fact, he offered all money in, in offerings, in, in collections, Mm -hmm. to the Melbourne to recoup their costs. And then from Australia, he came to New Zealand and we sponsored his New Ze part of his New Zealand tour. And uh, we, we, uh, we took up a collection to help Ron's work and Ron not accept it. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, when, when I gave him, he didn't sell one video. And when I gave him the, the money to, uh, uh, to take with him, as a donation, uh, the money that had been collected at the meetings. Hmm. He simply handed it back to me and says, take this for your costs in organizing the meeting. And that was Ron's attitude wherever hmm. he went. Hmm. So it's a deliberate lie. There's no, no backup in information at all to support what this man is accusing Ron of. Hmm. And I suppose that what you just said, Jonathan, it has been witnessed by other people. So n this is not just your own statement because you had some kind of a conspiracy going on with Ron Wyatt. I believe a lot of other people have witnessed what you just said. Oh, yes, most certainly they have. Mm. could testify likewise. So if one would go to, with an open mindset to this whole history, to all these discoveries, if one would just give it time and actually do the, the, their own research, do enough research, one by one, without even asking you, would most likely would discover the same thing and that you are saying now and that we're having this conversation. Yes, I can guarantee that fact. Mm. There's a pattern. A person has a pattern of being honest or being dishonest, and Ron's pattern was total honesty and humility. Mm. All right. Okay. And I, I got to know him very, very well. So I could st say without any fear at all that I could trust my life. If I was in danger, Ron would be honest. Mm. Well, that's, that's a strong statement. All right. Let's go on because uh, we have this other person, Jay Randall Price, in his uh, book, in Search of Temple Treasure, has about a page about Ron Wyatt in which he assessed that in a promotional brochure put together by an advertising company on Wyatt's behalf, the following claims were made which have been checked out and proven untrue. Number one is that Ron Wyatt claimed that he had attended Michigan State University. And number two claimed that this person, J. Randall Price, is saying here that he was a veteran of the Korean War. And based on these two false claims placed put a, a, against Ron Wyatt here, then the thing is that, which is in the public, well, 
I guess, Ron White, he was a con. Why should we trust him when he actually made his two false claims? So, based on your experience, based on your knowledge with Ron Wyatt, how about that, Jonathan? Well, I that some time ago, Ron Wyatt was invited to speak in Anchorage, Alaska. Mm. And a Protestant living there who'd read uh, Randall Price's book publicly warned his people not to go to Ron's meeting because it would be not the truth. Because he was trying to be a Korean veteran and he was not. So Ron Wyatt then publicly invited that minister to come to the meeting himself and he would be given an opportunity before the meeting to speak to the audience and tell them what he had just said to his congregation. Well, the minister actually couldn't hardly wriggle out of that. So he did end up and he called fraud uh, for making such a claim before the meeting actually went on. Hmm. And Ron then pulled from his pocket his plastic discharge card and asked the minister to examine it in front of the audience. Hmm. Well, the man sheepishly admitted that Ron was a Korean War veteran and any, anyone during the service of the Korean War was classified as a, as a uh, veteran. And the question would be, why did Randall Price write that he couldn't find any evidence that Ron was a veteran? The answer is he didn't look. Hmm. Well, what about Wyatt's claim that uh, he attended Michigan State University? Hmm. And if you were to ring that university, they would say Ron never attended there. Well, the fact is that Ron never claimed to have been at Michigan State University. Hmm. He went to Michigan University. Now there's a difference between the two places. Hmm. Well, again, we have a situation here when obviously, instead of going after Ron Wyatt's discoveries, obviously there has been a lot of targeting on Ron Wyatt as a person and trying to discredit Ron White as a person, as probably most likely, and as you're describing in your book here, has happened to you as well. So why do you believe that this is happening today? And it's happening especially when we're dealing with archaeology, which touches the Bible, which actually proves the Bible. So the, th the question is, who do you believe it's actually really behind? Why would somebody go after you, trying to discredit you, trying to put out that you're making false claims, trying to you know, create a false opinion, a public opinion about you and Ron Wyatt or anybody else that actually have been working with these discoveries. So what, what would you believe would be an agenda behind? Because this is a personal attack. You know, this is an ad hominem yeah. attack on you as a person and Ron Wyatt. Well, we find, find there's an historical pattern to this. Uh, when people are not successful in attacking discovery claims, hmm. they then attack the man making the claim. Because that's the next yeah. thing they can right. do. Hmm. Okay, so, well, by, by doing this, you know, the, I believe that the concept behind this or the idea or the plan is if I would be able to discredit your reputation, you know, to make people believe that you're a liar, you're a con, you're making these things up, then nobody would believe your discoveries. That's, isn't that probably what these other people would like to end with, with? That's the aim, yes. They cannot discredit the discoveries because the evidence is against their, their lies. Hmm. So they'll discredit the man making the discoveries. Hmm. All right, okay. Well, if we go on here, I believe that I have received, a, again, a lot of information, some of the most important archaeological reports on this side of human history. Thousands, you have thousands of pages, you have a lot of side reports, you have a lot of lab reports. We will be showing some of these reports as we go along uh, through our episode. You have letters again, you have pictures, you have artifacts, some of them, you have them personally, you have email communication and so on. So this is not just some pictures or just some verbal statements you're, ma uh, you're making. So again, I believe that apart from the origin of life, the biggest mysteries of the ancient world is the question of 
whether the historical events that you're actually recording here and which are recorded in the Bible actually happened. The, the stakes, again, of these questions we're having here are extremely high because today's world is so connected to the Bible. In fact, I believe that the Bible may have been the greatest single influence to shape the Western civilization. For more than 1,500 years, as a great part of the world accepted the truth of the biblical accounts. So how do you respond to charges being placed against you as, for example, New Age, witchery, spiritualism, Mormonism, all this accusation uh, leveled against you? Well, uh, we, we don't worry about what people say against us, but if it starts to affect other people whose faith may be shaken, we've got to stand up and uh, end the attacks. Hmm. I don't care what people say about me. Uh, I do care what, what is going to affect the faith of other people, though, as far as the Lord's concerned, whether hmm. they believe his word. Hmm. Is there any foundation? What are these people basing their accusation where they are claiming that you're spreading New Age philosophy through your books, through the literature and these discoveries? Where would that New Age be found? Well, it's interesting that uh, I have been attacked as uh, going into New Age and Spiritism uh, simply because I have quoted in, in some of my books uh, people who were New Age people. For example, in my book, Dead Secrets, which is a, a book of a thousand uh, features of the ancient world, ancient technology, I mention that a man called Eric Von Däniken, Mm -hmm. uh, a New Age man uh, who believed in uh, extraterrestrials having seeded mankind and, and brought civilization. I, I, I start talking about him, and because I mention him, but I, I discredit what he's saying, the fact that I mention his name in my book, uh, people say, oh, you're quoting a pagan. Well, now, I've been accused of, of in fact, of having a... a a, a new age room in our house, my wife and I, where we worship the devil. And there's no such thing. The person who came to who, to write uh, never even visited us. Hmm. Well, as for quoting pagans, we follow a biblical pattern. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17, 28 said, speaking of God, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own past have said, for we are also his offspring. Now, the Apostle Paul quoted a pagan, what we'd call today a new spiritualistic poet. And he said, for that poet of yours said, we are also his offspring. So Paul, speaking to the Greeks, spoke to the Greeks concerning somebody that they had their trust in. And this was the, the pagan philosopher, Eratus. So Eratus' statement and his Bible, because Paul quoted him. Now, he was a pantheistic poet, and Paul, by quoting him, was not in pantheism, hmm. but he was building a stronger case in the minds of his Greek listeners for the truth hmm. about God. And the main audience for which I wrote in my book, Dead Men and Sea, where I mentioned that uh, man, Eric Von Daniken, is the secular public who've been reading Von Daniken and other humanistic, occultic uh, books. And so I reached people we are. Hmm. And Jesus did the same. He reached people who believed in, in uh, the rich man and Lazarus uh, background. Now, Jesus talked about the rich man, went to Abe's bosom, went to Abraham's bosom and the rich man was in hell crying out. Now, Jesus, Jesus was not uh, endorsing that kind of belief that you can cry out from hell and somebody in Abraham's bosom who died can hear you. And Jesus was teaching a different lesson. So we might ask, was Jesus irresponsible by telling that story? Or did Jesus here present a teaching method that uh, would be 
uh, quietly but soundly reaching the human tendency to seek uh, uh, something that they didn't have. Hmm. Now, Jesus actually, from a, 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 it's not true about the rich man and Lazarus, man in hell calling out to a man in Abraham's bosom. He proceeded from what they believed to something that he wanted to teach them. And Jesus showed this as an excellent method. Now, if some people uh, got the wrong idea about Jesus, uh, he's the son of God. Look at the book of Daniel. The, the, the Bernian people were into dreams and visions. So what did God do? He used dreams and visions for King Nebuchadnezzar. And the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the sorcerers, uh, they studied and interpreted dreams. And so the king of heaven now descended to the, give one of the greatest prophecies in the world, the prophecy of Daniel 2, to a pagan king who was steeped in spiritism and believed in dreams and visions. So Jesus went from the dream and vision scenario to teach him something bigger. And Satan may use his advisors. He may speak to through heathen poets like Aratus, whom Paul quoted in the Bible. Or he might use Von Daniken, whom I quoted in my book. But to use such examples, legend, uh, is an excellent teaching method. It's a God-approved way of taking a person from something they trust and showing them something that they don't know about and don't trust. Hmm. And to dine with sinners, as Jesus did, is not to be a sinner. To cast out demons is not to be possessed uh, of a demon. Uh, and to take fallen human nature does not make Jesus a sinner. So... To use a, a, a pagan legend to teach a lesson is not to make you a pagan. And we're, we're told in the book of Acts that if counsel is of man, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, it will uh, it cannot be overthrown. Otherwise, you'll be fighting against God. And the discoveries, when we, we quote uh, non-Christians who, who support the discoveries, we're not... Uh, we're not condoning their way of life. We're simply quoting them as people who uh, are respected by the unbelievers and to lead those unbelievers to Jesus. Mm. All right. I think it's a very important, some very important statements that you just uh, made there. And I hope, at least for those of our viewers, those that are going to see these programs, these episodes are going to help help you and help everybody to overcome this skepticism. And this is actually our next uh, question here. And you've already covered here. That was my next actually question here, my next slide here, uh, your quotation in, in, in your book from Eric von Daniken. So we're not going to, uh, to go through this uh, as well. So how would you cope with skeptics this is the last question we're going to have in in, uh, in this episode here there is a lot of skepticism today and we know that this skepticism comes from a secular perspective we know that it's coming from a postmodernist perspective uh, relativism and so on there are a lot of ideologies today a lot of paradigms uh, you know mindsets uh, we're dealing with today but we're talking about skeptics within our own ranks, our own denomination, in the Christian world. What would you say as, as the last advice here in this episode? What would be the most important thing to do in relation to these discoveries for those which are skeptics about these discoveries? Well, well uh, Michael, um, our attitudes are influenced by our parents and the culture that we grow up in. And it's often hard to face information that we were not uh, prepared for. So we try to show understanding. Uh, Jesus loves these in individuals too who, who are skeptical and he died for them. And we prefer not to bite back. 
but just to get on with the work he's, God's given us to do, and we always pray for those that mm. persecute us. Mm. And sometimes for the sake of who are sharing the discovery materials and who suddenly find themselves under attack, we pray if we're for them, if we know their names. And we, in the face of criticism, both Ron Wyatt and I were always very calm and at peace with God. Hmm. And when I hear critics against our discoveries now, I still uh, know that the Lord's with us, so who against us? And hmm. any personal attacks on my character don't bother me. Hmm. Ron, Ron was the same way. Uh, and uh, we know God's on our side. And so we are fearless, we're relentless, we'll continue to share. Hmm. And uh, the work has to be done. Yeah. And we're careful not to get too distracted and sidetracked mm. uh, because our job is to spread the wonderful news of these discoveries to warn the world of a soon coming saviour. Mm. And the work has to be done and one has to be careful not to get too distracted with arguments and, uh, which would slow down the progress. So uh, God is watching over us. We're working for God himself. He loves us. love him. And that's where our focus is. Hmm. And uh, attacks by the skeptics, no problem. We pray for them and, and ask the Lord's Holy Spirit to soften their hearts and, and help them to see the truth. And many right. of them do. Hmm. All right. Well, even if I say that was the last question, I, I've been impressed while you were having uh, the last answer here to ask you another question here and that that will be the last because the, your aim of your discoveries actually the whole aim of these episodes here are not just to prove that the critics are wrong and uh, we're not doing a scholastic kind of a you know backwards attack we're not attacking anybody here and this is not about you know you or us against science and you just have to lay on the table Everything you have of these discoveries, every scientific proof, end of case, everybody's happy, everybody should believe that whatever you've discovered, that's true. Now, these are no ordinary discoveries, as you're actually putting it in your book. These discoveries provide the evidence of specific events of history where actually God intervened in human affairs on this very planet where Satan claims exclusive dominion, isn't that? So, so this is his territory. This is Satan's ground. So the last question yes. is that for our viewers, and also I would like uh, an answer from you, if you could uh, give us the answer. Why would we have even this conversation? And why this huge, this great controversy, also when it comes to these discoveries? Who's actually the real entity behind this controversy? Very good. Uh, these, as you said, are not ordinary discoveries. Mm -hmm. These discoveries provide evidence of specific events of history where God intervened in human affairs. Yes, on this very planet where Satan claims exclusive control. This is territory that Satan claims as his. And this is the, the very place where the war between the forces of good and evil is in place. It's all out war. Now, Satan has known all along where, where these discoveries are. He, he's known where Noah's Ark is. He's known the, the, where Sodom and Gomorrah was. He's known where Pharaoh's army was on the bottom of the sea. He's known the true Mount Sinai. He's, he's known where the Ark of the Covenant was. Satan would very much, would very much like to destroy these things before they could be discovered. But God has had his hand on them right through history hmm. and has protected them and served them for our day. So that uh, now, when they are discovered, it's at a time when Jesus is preparing to come back to earth and, and God wants this age of skepticism to wake up and mm. get for his, his return. Now, can you imagine how Satan feels about this? Mm. God protected these sites so nobody could destroy them. And Satan would love to have destroyed them before so God could not use them. So now 
God's going to is going to raise up people who are going to proclaim the discoveries, mm. and Satan is going to raise up people who are going to make make exception every lie, including respected leaders, to stop the discoveries getting out. It's the hatred of Satan for the discoveries that is, that is really supernatural, and this is because there's a supernatural power behind the discoveries. And uh, that supernatural power is going to use these to get people ready for Jesus' return. That's what it's all about, this war between Christ and Satan. Yeah. Well, that actually, I would say, that, that may lead. And thank you very much for the last answer. And thank you for being part of the second episode, Jonathan. And uh, I hope to see you uh, well and sound next time in our next episode. And are you, as you're stating in your coming book, again, the discoveries, miracles, and enemies, each one of these events that we are going to cover was a unique intervention in history and in prophecy. And each one is specifically linked, as you just mentioned, to the return of Jesus, imminent return, Jesus Christ, to this world. So again, this is not just archaeology, not just history, but prophecy fulfilling before our own eyes. So thank you, everybody. Stay tuned. Follow our Facebook page, our website for our upcoming programs with Jonathan and other exciting issues that will have an impact, impact on your life. And as always, remember, your mind is the end target. Thank you, Jonathan. My pleasure. Thank you.